All right, so my assignment is to talk to you about how we manage acute type B aortic dissections. And it really is nice to finish at the end of the day because now you have a lot of knowledge. And so I can just tell you about cool cases. Um, I don't have any disclosures. So type B aortic dissections, um, you know, as you've heard, it's some, that's something that starts in the distal, um, distal to the arch, basically, right at the proximal descending thoracic aorta, distal to the subclavian artery, and basically it's a tear in the wall of the artery. Uh, what I'm showing you here are pictures of an intravascular ultrasound. This is uh, something we haven't talked about today, but it's basically a nice little um, piece of machinery that comes on a probe and you put it up at the artery and you can actually look from the inside of the artery. And so this is how I think of aortic dissections. It's that that's the vision that comes to mind when I think of it. Because you can see the flap moving in real time. You can mark um, the location of the entry tears and you can make sure that your wire's in the right place and you can do measurements. So it's a very nice tool that we use all the time when we do our aortic dissection cases. So to give you a little bit of background, I'm from the University of Washington in Seattle, and we actually cover the WAMI region, which is a multi-state region which covers about a quarter of the land of the United States. So we are a referral center. We get patients that can come all the way from Alaska. And, uh, and that really biases the practice that we do. Um, you can see that when we look at people with type B dissection, we think of them in terms of, quote, complicated versus not complicated. And what that means is are they dying from their aortic dissection right now, from the type B dissection? Do they have malperfusion? Is their gut malperfused? Do they have limb ischemia? Or are they having a rupture? And normally, if you look at all comers, you know, it's about one-third that are complicated versus two-thirds. But based on our practice, we actually see majority of them are complicated because they are referred to us because they're complicated, whereas folks who are uncomplicated tend to stay in their local hospitals. Um, and so I will talk about both the complicated and uncomplicated approaches. Um, and the big thing is to look for red flags. And I gave a talk about that yesterday to a couple of folks, so that may be redundant. But part of the way now we have to think about these dissections is, you know, are they genetically true? Triggered, not just, oh, it's just an aortic dissection. And so there's definitely elements in the history and the physical exam and the imaging findings that we have to process fairly quickly when somebody gets transferred to us with an aortic dissection. Um, so the big triggers are age and family history. You saw the cases that uh, Morale showed. I mean, most of these people with type A dissections are fairly young, but also type B dissections can present fairly young. And if they are young, it really has to just trigger an attention that this is genetically triggered as opposed to a 70-year-old person with an aortic dissection. Um, and if they have family history. A lot of times, if they're in extremis, of course, we cannot get family history, or you'll have something jotted down very quickly from the transferring center. Um, but you know, if they're able to tell us about their family history, that's also helpful information to know up front. I'm showing you just preliminary data analysis in our UW experience where we looked at 227 people where we were able to get complete family history on them. And it shows you that one in four have actually a dissection that is genetically triggered. They had a family history of aortic dissections, aneurysms, or sudden death. So it's not uncommon in this patient population. And about 9% were syndromic. Most of them were Marfan syndrome. Uh, and then 23% had a familial history. And the median age was 50 years old. So they're not as young as the people who present with type A dissections. Uh, but they're not as old as classically when we think of a 60 or 70 year old person. And so quickly on the, on the history and physical exam findings, definitely the residents have been lectured extensively about this. Now we actually have to do a full exam on the patient, not just, um, you know, and this doesn't take a lot of time really to just look at them head to toe, but to just look for any things that, you know, you know make you say, oh, maybe there's something more, whether or not they have a history of easy bruising. We ask them about prior pneumothoraces and hemothoraces, um, certainly if they've had any history of early strokes or MIs, and ask about the family history as well, if it has any of these features as well. We look for scoliosis, uh, if they've had a history of hernias, if they had poor healing wounds. Uh, so we make note of these things when we see them. Uh, this is an example of a high arch on the bottom. This is a patient with Marfan syndrome. And on top, it's the lens dislocation where you see the shimmering. We also look at characteristic facial features. Uh, the way my practice is set up, I see quite a bit of vascular list down -list syndrome, so then I don't miss the opportunity to teach the residents about this, to actually look for facial features as well. Um, and this is not 100% accurate in terms of diagnosing somebody, but again, it just makes you pay attention to what is going on. Imaging findings, uh, we don't only look at the descending thoracic aorta or the abdominal aorta. Now as vascular surgeons, we have to pay attention to other parts of the aorta similar, like we have to pay attention to the heart as well. I actually now look to see if the heart looks enlarged or something happening in it, so it's not just the pump. But I also look at the root and the ascending aorta. And it's really surprising to me to see people, like for example, this person who has a very large root. I mean, this is unmistakable. But then it's funny when they get sent to us, nobody comments on, oh, hey, by the way, they have an aortic root aneurysm in addition to their type B 
day section. And so you have to pay attention to these. And for Shane, for Shane I put that picture of the tortuosity of a Marfan's patients just for you. Uh, because of you, I actually pay attention to these things now. Uh, and certainly if they have any evidence of scoliosis. The other thing is all the way um, on the end here, I'm showing you the celiac axis. So this is a celiac artery into the splenic artery. And you can see that it is aneurysmal. And this is important to pay attention to these things because normal people don't have aneurysmal visceral arteries. And so you want to pay it, you know, when you're scanning the scan, just kind of make a mental note or do the arteries look normal? And I'll show you a couple of examples of that. So the big thing in the medical management arm is hypertension control. That cannot be overstated. That really makes a difference. Even in people with heritable connective tissue disorders or genetically triggered diseases, I've had Marfan's patients who are very fastidious about blood pressure control, and this is a person who has a PRKG1 mutation who is very fastidious about her blood pressure control, and they actually can stabilize their aorta over time. It doesn't make the follow-up any less intensive, but the point is you can empower the patients to say that this may be a tool that can help. Not a guarantee, but it could make a difference, and certainly we have seen that. Um, sometimes medical management doesn't work. This is a patient who has a haploinsufficiency uh, mutation in COL3A1, so they have vascular EDS. He had a type B dissection, and this is a guy who traveled extensively, so he came back from India and had some enteric um, symptoms of diarrhea, and it turned out that he basically seeded his aorta, and then he unfortunately ruptured, and it actually showed salmonella in that. So sometimes things don't go the way you want them to go. <coughs> And then the other thing that we don't know, and this is a big knowledge gap, is trying to predict who will stabilize their aorta with medical management versus who will continue to degenerate. Uh, this is a picture of a patient who had Marfan syndrome who showed up with this enlarged aorta and he ruptured that night on admission and died. And that was actually, for me, a pivotal point in my training career where I decided that this is what I want to pursue. So I always put this to remember that this is why I got into this particular specialty. So switching to the people who are actually dying or trying to die on you with this malperfusion or rupture. Uh, and so these are sick people and you really have to mobilize fairly quickly to take care of them. And our principles is that we do treat them preferentially with a TVAR, thoracic endovascular repair. Dr. Forbes just talked about that. And we use IVIS routinely. That ultrasound will show you examples. And sometimes you have to add fenestrations, meaning making bigger holes in the, in the abdominal aorta as well if the malperfusion doesn't correct with TVAR. Although in our experience, that has been very rarely needed. And so TVAR obviously was a game changer in the world of vascular surgery and particularly in taking care of these patients. Um, I can say that I have never seen an open acute descending thoracic aortic repair for, for dissections. Uh, we really, in my training and forward, has always been approached with TVARs. Uh, so definitely a game changer. And uh, Dr. Forbes talked about all the graphs, so we don't need to belabor those. So how do I approach this? I mean, the big thing is, like I said, is I do use the, um, the uh, IVUS to kind of take a good look at the aorta. And these are just representative sections of the IVUS compared to the CT scan where you can see. And this person, if you look at the CT panel in the middle, you can see that they have very, very tight true lumen where there's barely any blood flow going into the mesenteric arteries. And this person had abdominal pain, diarrhea, and also on top of that had an acute limb ischemia as well, had a cold leg from the malperfusion. And you can see on the IVUS that the flaps are stuck on the, on the actual probe that there's barely any blood going through. And so the nice thing about when you do the TVAR, then you can come back and take a look and you can see on the top panel it's the before the TVAR and then below on the bottom panel is after the TVAR and that opens up that lumen very nicely and actually corrected his limb ischemia and all the symptoms that he had. He did have an exploratory laparotomy, we looked at his intestines, they looked nice and pink and so that was that and he was actually, you know, he left the hospital. Uh, so it is a nice tool in that circumstance. This is what we want it to look like. So this guy is interesting. He was 53, he was driving his Viper on a very beautiful sunny Seattle day and all of a sudden something happened and he crashed his car. He showed up as a trauma code, he was in hemorrhagic shock. It turned out he had a type B aortic dissection. We think he probably dissected, then crashed his car and then ruptured his dissection. So it came in in extremis. Um, and you can see the dissection goes all the way to the abdominal aorta. And what was great about TVAR is, and I'll slow this down a little bit to show you what that looks like, but basically his aorta corrected completely. If I can go back to show you that, or maybe you can see it on this one. 
but basically completely remodeled. And even the section that did not have the stent graft healed. So the aorta looks entirely normal. This is the CT scan that was done within a month of the operation. He was still intubated, dealing with his chest tubes and his pneumonia, but uh, his aorta remodeled beautifully. So that is what we want out of TVAR. But in reality, in the genetically triggered aortic domain, there's really not a lot of data. There's very limited data, as Dr. Forbes had shown some of the papers I've done. This was a review looking at Marfan patients specifically. And the main challenge has been the seal and the proximal aorta. Those are called type 1 endoleaks, and you can see they're fairly high numbers, where it just doesn't sit right and it leaks around there. And so that's one concern. The other concern is what we talked about, the retrograde aortic dissection concerns from the radial force. And I don't need to go through this again because we already covered it. But here's an example of somebody who had um, a retrograde aortic dissection post TVAR and died on the table. I mean, it was very, very dramatic. And uh, it was interesting because I was talking to the surgeon afterwards about it, and the surgeon, of course, was blaming themselves for this event. But in reality, if you look at the pictures, there's some things that actually make you go, this person did not have normal tissue, even though this was 56 year old. Um, initially, the family history always scribbled as father with aneurysm question mark. So it's really not entirely clear. But if you look at them, a couple things stand out. They have a bovine arch up top. You can see where the common origin of the innominate and the uh, left common carotid um, right common carotid right common carotid artery and left common carotid artery innominate basically everything is coming off the one area and then off the left subclavian I don't know if the arrow shows but his vertebral artery comes off distal to the subclavian right there so that was one thing that was interesting about his anatomy the other component is if you look here and it's going to go by fast but if you watch, here's his dissection, aneurysm, aneurysm right here, and then his iliac arteries are aneurysmal as well. So clearly I think this person had an underlying connective tissue disorder. The other component in him specifically is that he had the bare uh, wires and his stent, the stent graft that was put in, and I think that contributed to that uh, event. So that was a learning experience for all of us. The other thing that uh, Tom had mentioned is not ballooning after TVARS, and I think that's definitely absolutely a no-no now. Uh, these are old slides. This was actually using a C-arm, and so you can see that, that it's, this person got ballooned after their TVAR and later on had a retrograde dissection. Um, so we don't balloon anymore. Next thing to think about is you know, following these people. So again, Sometimes you have to do this operation to get people out of trouble with malperfusion. And this is a woman who came in with malperfusion, but she um, did have a family history of sudden death. And it was really just her grandmother had died in her sleep at the age of 40. There was no autopsy and no other history. Her parents are alive and well, and her siblings are alive and well. But what's interesting about her is if you see the original, this is two weeks post TVAR, you can see there's already not sealing around the graft. And this continued to get worse over time. And even all the way down here, you can see the graft is just floating in the lumen um, and just hanging out. So she, as I was leaving to come to this meeting, came to the emergency room with chest pain. Uh, and that's how we, I got her images. So I just put these pictures to show you that <laughs> TVAR sometimes is not the best idea. And I would say the teaching on her is she should have been referred somewhere around here early on. Get her out of trouble, heal her, but then send her so we can talk about the definitive repair. Another example of where you can't get away with this, when TVARS happened, this is a nine-year-old operation, so there was a lot of enthusiasm at the time and maybe not as much appreciation for how detrimental these things can be, but this is a patient with Marfan syndrome who had uh, a TVAR placed. And again, you can see that the graft was slipping over time, and then nine years later, she basically had a type A aortic dissection, uh, which was quite detrimental to her. So what are the other options? This is a guy, now here's this is a more ideal type situation. So this is a guy who came in, he's 39. Uh, he had a father who had a history of abdominal aortic aneurysm. He came in with a type B and he had some malperfusion, so he got his TVAR. The nice thing about it is then they referred him to us to see him. And the first thing I said, did anyone tell you you have an aneurysm near aortic root? And he's like, no, I've never heard of that. It's like, okay, you do. I'm going to send you to our cardiac folks. And what was nice is then they were able to uh, repair that and basically replace the whole arch and tie it into the stent graft that's there. And so now all of that is fixed. And we have the distal portion to deal with at some point, potentially. Um, so that's the one that we're watching for. So again, it's a nice way of, of how you can temporize somebody but you have to think about what the next step should look like for them. And his testing showed the TGF-B2 uh, receptor uh, mutation. 
So what we learned, a couple of things, um, open exposure and repair the of the femoral arteries, and I don't know if I left that picture. Oh, I think I took it away, sorry. There is a nice picture of actually a bad groin complication. So I think the one thing to think about is when we do these percutaneously, meaning we close it with sutures from the inside, sometimes that doesn't hold very well in people with connective tissue disorders um, or genetically triggered disease, and so we have to do an open repair. So I think that's worthwhile. Intravascular ultrasound is something we use routinely, minimal or no oversizing, which we had talked about, and we use the ultrasound to measure measure the uh, portion of the arch proximal to where we're going to put it to get, get the right measurement. Um, and then we, I do prefer the covered stents, so we've moved away from using uh, bare metal wires. Um, and then we monitor, obviously, for retrograde dissection. And the lesson is that this is always a risk until we fix the actual platform. And so if we have to bail somebody out in an acute setting, we need to you know, very quickly talk about what we're going to do for the rest of the aorta to stabilize it. So think of it as a temporizing measure. And then the multidisciplinary approach is obviously very important. The other thing is the key to diagnosis is recognition. So all those red flags need to come into play when somebody's there. It's not just, oh, they have a dissection, let's just park them on antihypertensive and send them home. They really, it, it does take a fair bit of thought about them and just thinking about them that way. Hypertension, like I said, is a cornerstone. No matter what, whether they have a stent graft or not, you still have to control their blood pressure. Um, TVAR is a great tool in the acute phase, even for people with um, genet genetically triggered aortopathies. Uh, the basics still matter in terms of technique and being fastidious and how these things are placed, uh, and then obviously close follow-up and a discussion about how we're going to fix this uh, overall. That's all I have, and thank you for your time. Well, thank you for that wonderful talk. Are there any questions from the audience? Shireen, a great talk. I'm never around during the acute dissection, so pardon my ignorant question. Um, you talked about um, using TVA in extremis, and my question is really, is CPR too late? Once you're doing CPR... We've taken them to the OR and tried. They have okay. not survived, the ones that I've done. Okay. But we have gone to the OR and tried. Okay. So CPR is kind of the watershed moment. Yeah. I mean, like this... For example, the, the sickest person I've taken was this guy with the hemorrhagic shock and the bleeding from his chest, right? Mm. He didn't code, but he was pretty sick. Mm. Um, so we were able to stabilize him. But I think once you enter CPR land, it gets a lot harder at that point. How long does it take? To what, In, to in a patient in... No, no, no. <laughs> I know that happens pretty fast. The, uh, <laughs> um, it, so if you have a patient in extremis um, and you're getting the TVAR in, how fast can you go? So for that particular person, I got the call when he showed up, when, as soon as they got the CT scan. So I was there within like 15 minutes, and the mm -hmm. room was already rolling. So we, I showed up, examined him, and we just ran into the room. So within an hour, everything was in place. Yeah, I could see how CPR is probably too late if yeah. it's a one-hour procedure. Yeah, because, I mean, you need, you know, they still have to open the equipment, right? right? You have to get the room ready. And, yeah. you know, but getting, once you get access, things go fairly quickly because mm -hmm. you already know what you're looking for. Um, the problem is, I mean, you can also bypass the whole idea of this, of this ultrasound. That doesn't take a lot of time, in my opinion, and I think I'd rather be safe and know where my wires are sitting. Mm -hmm. um, so but that eats a little bit of time. But once you get the stent up and deployed, that's fairly quick. Thank you. Uh, great talk. Um, bit of a bit of a segue, but what's what's the UW approach to the acute type A dissection that comes in with distal ischemia, so bilateral lower extremities and evidence of gut ischemia? What's 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 your approach? That is a great question. We've gone back and forth. So we've tried the approach of saying, well, just fix the ascending first, and then we'll assess what's left. Um, that has been one option. We've talked about trying to deploy a TVAR up front. We've done that in a couple of cases where we TVAR first and then they open the chest. And I think it depends on how sick they are, right? I mean, if, if, they're, if, they're, if they have bloody stools at that point, I think it's worthwhile to try to T-bar to open up some sort of perfusion uh, and open up the belly as well to make sure that the bowels are not dead before, they, you know, before the cardiac surgeons start. So we've done that as well, where we've opened first, you know, T-bar open, and then they proceed. What do you guys do? Administration or malfunction <coughs> procedure rather than T-bar do you open? Your... We've gone to TVAR because honestly, like they, it's just it really does open everything else very nicely, and so we haven't found that we needed to do fenestration. Fenestration. I mean, in our data set, you know, the IR folks used to do fenestrations back in the day before TVAR, um, but I haven't done it 
dissection stents, uh, uncovered stents distally? We were just part of covered possible? Just part of at the trial, we had them. And then now that it's not as part of the trial, we just do this. Then. And like I said, I showed you that picture. I mean, you think it's not going to open. And it's really remarkable how it just opens up everything. And then I guess once the primary entry tear is fixed, it's like when doing a femoral crossover, right? It often thromboses once the primary entry tear is... is, is, is You're talking about the... Well, if you do have unilateral or extremity ischemia, and you have to up front do a femoral crossover, and then once the primary entry tear is fixed, um, often that crossover is thrombosed. So, yeah. yeah, and it's interesting, right, And it, because it's also interesting, I preferentially will go through the limb that's ischemic. So I will access the, the thrombose, quote the thrombose artery, and it's not really thrombosis per se, it's just that it's flap, and as soon as the graft is up, it, it opens that up as well. And we, Tom, to, just to add some further discussion to your question, you know, our group, we, we do tend to repair the dissection first and then deal with malperfusion later because it often gets better, but some groups, it's not the most common approach, but some groups like Himanshu, Patel, and Michael Deeb in Michigan, mm -hmm will actually delay the operation and fenestrate or do something before. Now, they, their patients have a, those patients have a high mortality from dying from the dissection. Their results of surgery for dissection are better because they've self-selected. Um, so I'm not sure I think that's, I, I personally don't think that's a great approach, but certainly they, they do, and that's how they manage. Right. And that's why we've been on the fence. We yeah. haven't, you know, I mean, we have done this, you know, where the surgeons say, well, can we at least open, you know, have general surgery, take a look at the bowels and see? Mm -hmm. Uh, before proceeding, and even then, you know, those folks have done well. Like you open, they look dusky, but as soon as you fix them, they pink up. So I think maybe there's wisdom in the old way of just saying. Well, and with Mike fix and I them. were talking about it up here on the podium. Like, there's the, also the possibility of doing a uh, putting a T-bar device from the while you're doing the dissection yeah. repair, either through a, a hybrid arch approach or some, there's other forms of doing that. Yeah. It does lengthen the operation and potentially prolongs the ischemia. Uh, but again, some groups like Mike will actually use perfusion, uh, like adjunct perfusion approaches to try to restore perfusion while you're cooling and circa resting so that you're not necessarily prolonging the ischemic period. Yeah. I mean, for the legs, sometimes just do a fem fem right. while everything yeah. else well, is happening. That's that. a quick way of doing it. It's just the mesenteric ischemia is always challenging. No, it's been a recent topic at, at, our, at our place because there's been some complex cases, and even you know, Dr. Lindsay had to do a, an endovascular. Uh, fenestration procedure for one patient so it was a topic about the order of events. And Mike, I remember back in London, I think the first time you and Kirk Lawler did this, where you did the stent graft first before the type A before the type A repair. And Joe Bavaria happened to be a guest, uh, you know, that week and we presented that case. And he and he basically accused us all of malpractice, you know, <laughs> of not yeah. doing the type A dissection yeah. first. And then. Yeah, that's interesting. Can I ask just one quick question? So, uh, you know, many people have observed that. Uh, putting in a stent graft uh, in the descending aorta, if you're ascending aorta, is not frankly aneurysmal, but is dilated or slightly dilated, like 38 to 40 millimeters is a risk factor for retrograde type A dissection. Um, I wonder whether or not those thresholds apply for you in, the gen in patients with genetically derived aortopathy, whether you, whether even more conservative, putting a stent in the descending when the ascending is mildly dilated but not aneurysmal? So again, it's the, the only way I would put it is that if they're really an extremist. I see, okay. I mean, if there's any room to wiggle around that and we can stabilize them, I'd rather address the ascending because we've had that. We've also had these people that show up where they have the type B dissection, but then they have intramural hematoma and the arch and the ascending. Um, so it's always been it's like, well, can we fix the front end and we'll drop a stent at that time. So yeah, so, great, thank you. <laughs>